Look at this. The participants are coming in. It's not even 7.30 yet. We have 76 people, 80 people. Okay, great. So welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And we are also live streaming. So welcome, all you people out there in Facebook land. Um, do I sound okay? All right. Um, yes. I'm pulling this up. Okay, so I'm going to get started right now. This is our progressive decade launch. This right here is the kickoff celebration. This is the party to make the 2020s a progressive decade. And for the people here who got here on time, I'm going to filibuster a little bit. I'm going to do a talking filibuster, actually, and use this time to teach you all a little chant. So it goes like this. When I say progressive, you say decade. Progressive, decade. Progressive, decade. When I say progressive, you say decade. Progressive, decade. Progressive, decade. You got it. See, that was good. Although I couldn't hear you. Um, but yes, this is really happening. We have 300 people here already. There are 900 RSVPs. So the people are trickling in. And, and this is a rare evening call for us. We usually do them during the day. So thank you all for having dinner with us, with the MVP family. Get yourself comfortable, get some food, get something to drink. You can picture we're having a cozy little salon um, in this warm co corner of the internet. And yeah, so um, let's go on to the next slide. And I'm gonna give a couple quick notes. Um, first of all, we recommend watching on video for a better experience if you're not on video yet. Um, it's not too late to invite people. I just invited my Aunt Ruthie, who lives near Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and my Uncle Jeff in West Virginia. So invite your people. Let's do some organizing. You're about to hear from some amazing organizers. Time to do your own organizing. It's not too late. And if you're new to MVP, welcome, welcome, welcome. We love new people. And you can check out movement.vote for some more background. There's a report on, on there on the, the 2020 grants and work we did and amazing videos from local partners and groups, including Salim and uh, actually and Maurice too, and Alex, who you're gonna hear from on this call. Um, so we wanna encourage you all to use the chat. So feel free to introduce yourselves on the chat, say where you're from, you can talk about your visions for the progressive decade. And also we're gonna use the chat to ask questions. Instead of waiting to the end for Q&A, the whole call is gonna be one big Q&A and there are a lot of team members who can answer your questions in real time. So let's, let's get this started. Um, first of all, with some thank yous. Um, wow, we have 400 people on the call now. All right, so just wanna start with huge, huge, huge gratitude to all of you. MVP donors, local partners, friends, our amazing local teams from Washington State to Massachusetts. Massachusetts makes some noise. Um, <laughs> I'm here in Massachusetts. A grassroots donor organizers. It really takes all of us to make this magic happen. And big shout outs to our donor organizing and fundraising partners who are listed on the, the right side of the screen, uh, just to some of them um, and allies. We're all in this together. We're all trying to move money to the groups. And it's a, really been a beautiful spirit of collaboration. Um, so if you're with any of these groups, you're, we're all in this together. And I wanna give a super special shout out to the MVP team, our state advisors on the ground in 12 key states, our amazing donor advisors and donor organizers across the country who work with many of you on your donations, our capacity building and operations team, our systems and data and legal, and a huge shout out to our comms team, Elizabeth, Rain, and Alex, who created the presentation, are holding the back end and the live stream, making it happen. Um, there's a live stream actually happening on uh, Facebook with Occupy Dems and Progress for Humanity and uh, a bunch of our partners are live streaming it. 
Um, and MVP is just so blessed to have such an amazing leaderful team and so many great partners. I wish you could meet them all right now on this call, um, but instead you're stuck with me. And I'm Billy Wimsat, MVP's executive director, joined by my colleague Mirna Orozco, our director of state programs. And we are here today to talk about MVP's progressive decade strategy. Make some noise, yay! It's our kickoff celebration party, okay. So to win all the elections and all the policies and all these states and make the 2020s a progressive decade to get the change we need at every level, right? So, so for some of you just joining, we're gonna teach you this chant. I say progressive, you say decade. Progressive decade, progressive decade. Make the 2020s a progressive decade. Progressive decade, progressive decade, right? Because there's, you know, there's been so much going on with the pandemic and with this election and so many things. We haven't even really had a chance to take a step back and reflect. We're in a new decade, right? We're in the 20s, the 2020s, which will be in the future known as the 20s, you know? And you think about decades like the 60s, we're like this. The 80s, we're like this. What are the 2020s going to be like? What's gonna be the legacy of this generation in this history of the planet? What are people gonna look back and say about us in about the 20s? As a generation of people who are alive today, we have the chance to make the 2020s a progressive decade, a decade that transforms American history. We get to do that, big things. We get to do big things. And we know some of you are ready to take action right now. Like, I don't even want to listen to the speakers. Just what are we doing? You know, get, let's get to the action, right? So here's the action slide we're going to come back to at the end. But basically, we want you to make a plan. Donate, donate now, make plans to donate before or in the future. Testify and organize. Organize your people. We'll come back to this at the end. Um, and, but the short version is if you're interested, um, you can reach out to your MVP liaison or go to movement.vote slash volunteer or on the movement vote website. It's right in the upper right hand corner volunteer and just let us know you're interested. We're revamping our entire way that we're doing peer to peer donor organizing and we want people to raise their hands and let us know um, once we're ready um, who wants to be involved. So um, next slide. Here's how to donate. And that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we'll come back to that at the end too. Um, and you are about to hear from some very special guests. We're gonna hear from Alex from Lucha in Arizona. She's gonna share a case study about their amazing work there. We're gonna hear from a collaboration of three organizations in Pennsylvania. We're gonna share a case study on a local election in May of this year, 2021 and also illustrate the power of local collaboration and local justice organizing. Then we're going to hear from Maurice Mitchell from Working Families, incredible movement visionary. If you haven't heard of him, you're in for a treat. And a few of MVP's amazing donors, Catherine and Saquon, sharing their testimonies. And then we're all going to go out and organize this progressive decade. Are you ready? I say progressive, you say decade. Progressive decade, progressive decade. All right, let's go. So after the election, people started asking us, what comes after 2020? What is MVP going to do now that Trump is in office? Is MVP even going to exist anymore? And I'm going to pass it to my awesome colleague, Mirna Orozco, to talk about that. Mirna? Thanks so much, Billy. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of answering that question, what happens after the election, um, I wanna take a moment and pause with some of you um, and celebrate because I actually saw in the chat, folks were actually also celebrating the fact that we won, um, the fact that we did it, the fact that um, so much is changing for so many people. If you check out this amazing slide that our awesome comms team put together, you're able to see some of the amazing work that our movement partners that MVP did on the ground y'all there's over 200 million voter contacts and over 120 million dollars moved last year that's 
amazing and it wouldn't have happened with all, all of you on this call and some of the amazing movement partners that we have with us today. Um, it's so exciting to be able to see and say that we went from a Republican trifecta to a Democratic one and there's been real and tangible outcomes from these numbers, right? It's not just 200 million voters, it's 200 million people, 200 million stories um, and that's something to celebrate and I'm so excited about all of the work that's also to come. But I want to share a little bit about some of those tangible outcomes. Um, some of you already know because I talk about it a lot, but I get to work with immigrant communities um, on the side as well uh, to just work with them for their liberation and for their freedom um, and in the sanctuary movement. And because of this win, because of what folks were able to do um, last year, you know, Abby, whose permission I have to share um, her story, was able to leave the church basement she's been living in for over three years um, and go to the park with her kids, breathe fresh air for the first time in three years. Um, that's amazing. And you all, everybody single person on this call helped to make that happen. And that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, at MVP, we're still celebrating. We're gonna continue to celebrate and we hope that you are too. Um, however, uh, we're celebrating with cautious optimism, um, right? Because we know that while we won, we know that it wasn't easy and that we did so just barely in some places. And we also know that winning in 2024 is not guaranteed. This is a threat um, of going back to a crazy um, time is still real. It doesn't go away. And I want you to keep that in mind throughout today's presentation, right? Because it's important to remember that we did it and we're celebrating and it's amazing, um, but we can't stop. We have to make sure that in 2024 and beyond, we keep defending these seats. We keep doing the work that we're doing in order to make sure that the soaring 20s, as many of you said, actually become a reality. So now I can go back to the original question of what comes next. Um, for starters, our movement partners are already doing so much and you'll get to hear a bit more about that later. Um, but at MVP, what we're doing is doing what we know works best, right? Um, if anything uh, that we learned from last year is that our theory of change works, that supporting movement organizations, people on the ground with enough resources to do what they do best actually works and we win. And so we're doubling down on that. Um, and uh, the core of what we're going to be doing and our plan for the next four years is to do that even bigger and better. Um, so what does that look like and how does MVP work? I'm going to be able um, to share a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, for those of you who might be new to MVP, welcome. Um, this slide shows a little bit about our model and it's actually pretty simple, right? We support organizations not just with money, and I'll get to talk more about that later throughout the presentation, um, but we support them. They organize, they win elections, they change policy, they deliver results to their communities, um, and they do it over and over again, building for a better progressive decade. It's a pretty awesome cycle. And there's a lot that goes into that, um, right? In this next slide that you're seeing here, and I just look slightly because I have a new screen where I can see exactly what everybody else is seeing. Um, it talks a little bit about our model, right? First is state ecosystems. We don't just fund one or two groups um, in a state, but whole state ecosystems, as many as 30 to 40 groups in a state. We also make four-year commitments, and this is new, and we're really excited about the fact that we're gonna be able to make some four-year commitments so our partners have support to go big and know that we have their backs. Also a plug that this is so much easier if those of you who can also make for your commitments so that we're able to go bigger and better in supporting our partners with this. We also do capacity building, all right, moving more than just money, but resources like tech tools, coaching, consultants, and so much more to help our groups. We also seed and voterize, supporting new groups that want to do electoral work or that want to register voters um, and groups that are doing this for the very first time. We also do donor organizing at scale because we believe in donor organizing. Organizing happens everywhere, not just from our movement partners, but through our work here at MVP as well. That's actually what we're doing right now. So thank you so much for being a part of it. And that we're also in partnership. We know that this work is so much bigger than any one organization. And we really deeply believe in working in partnership with all of our allies in a way that is greater than the sum of our parts. And one of those amazing partners is Lucha in Arizona. Um, I have the privilege of passing the virtual mic to my friend and co-conspirator Alex Gomez, who's the co-director of Lucha, to talk a little bit more about how they delivered such a beautiful 
uh, vision of seeing that Arizona red turn blue in this past cycle and to tell you more about their work um, and how that relates to what groups are doing now and what we're going to be doing um, in this next uh, few years. So passing it over to Alex. Thank you so much, Ms. Matt. Thank you so much, MVP team, Billy. But thank you so much to all of the funding community that were partners with us in this past election. It was a knockdown, drag out fight. Um, but in the spirit of a new decade and joining in in that chant as like a, a homegrown organizer, um, we're looking forward. And the people that won organized. Um, and what exactly did we win? We were able to elect a Democrat in Arizona for president, um, Joe Biden, and a senator, Democrat, Mark Kelly. Um, and we started, though, in 2012 with under 50% of eligible Latinos registered and ended in 2020 with about 65% of eligible Latinos registered. That is a testament to the long-term organizing and the long view um, and why organizing is critical for change in our communities. What we also did was quadruple the number of Latinos on the pebble. As a whole entire ecosystem through one Arizona, we were able to register 185,000 people in 2020, but pausing and reminding us that it was in the middle of a pandemic. 35,000 of that happened on the field from January to March, and the rest of it happened virtually through innovations that came out like drive-through voter registration, using QR codes that people can scan and leaving them at schools and at churches and at supermarkets, um, making sure that we were trying to reach our communities wherever they were to register to vote. And on the C4 side, what we were able to accomplish is 1.2 million doors knocked. The MEAZ program saw 80, uh, 38% um, rate increase, whereas in, 20, in, in 2018, sorry, we only had 21%. And so for us, those numbers are tremendous because that is the work of young people. To share a little bit about for power building organizations like ours, grassroots organizations, there's just something different at what's at stake for us. For me, my father was undocumented, and he is the reason that I am here today fighting because I want to make sure that these types of policies, bad actors, bad policies, we can't run from them. We ran from them in California, but we stayed and fought in Arizona, along with so many other young people. You see, Lucha was born out of the ashes of SB 1070 in the middle of a fight. There was hardly any infrastructure. You couldn't really point to organizations, but you can point to young leaders, volunteers that were ready to fight and that wanted a space and wanted somewhere to be able to lift their voices in outrage and fight for justice. And so out of that, being able to center young people and their leadership, to be able to center the long view in our work also helped us determine that it was about marching in the streets and elevating the narrative of the racial profiling that was happening in Arizona, but it was also about building power and registering people that were left out of the process by the parties. And it took independent power organizations and 10 years of not stopping to be able to have the outcomes that we did in 2020. So not only did we have this incredible victory at a federal level, but in Arizona, we passed another proposition, 208, that is now taxing the rich. These are things that in Arizona were never thought possible, and we are making them possible through people power. And so for me, what that feels like is so much joy um, and so much energy to continue fighting and 
find our people. Because even though we had these incredible victories, we're calling in people and looking to the next decade because we still have a fight in our hands. We had an incredible victory at a federal level, but within our state legislators, we still have a Republican trifecta. And what that has meant for Arizona is that currently we have had over a hundred anti-democracy bills and the most egregious, but that because of people power, because of the power of coalitions, because of Arizona Advocacy Network, you might hear our voice, our vote, um, Corina calling us and telling us, what do you need? We will get it to you right now. Um, what we have been able to do is find a route to kill SB 1485. That is the permanent early voting list. Permanent is what we are saying. So when someone signs up to vote and be a permanent part of the process, what legislators are saying now is that we actually wanna strip the permanent early voting list. We want to get rid of 100,000 people. Those 100,000 people are black indigenous people of color. But what we are saying is that we will not allow it, that we will continue the fight and we will continue building. And what we are doing is we have a fight at the legislature but we're already looking to 2022. So we are getting ready because we have a governor's race. So we are in the precincts now, talking to people, making phone calls through our digital program. As an ecosystem, we were able to change it in Arizona. And as an ecosystem, we're gonna be able to move Arizona into having a democratic governor, um, being able to ensure that our attorney general is also on the Democrat side but looking to ensure that we are also paying attention to our federal landscape and pushing those senators that have been quiet, but also push, pushing those senators that have demonstrated that they want to obstruct um, bold policy reform. And so for us, it's about pushing them. It's about staying true to our mission and centering the most impacted and making sure that we are delivering bold policies for them. And with that, I thank you um, for all of your support in helping Arizona, not forgetting about Arizona and our fights that we still have. We had some victories, but we need to continue building and we need to build together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, um, for that. Uh, I think about what you just said and, and get so excited for the possibility of breaking that Republican trifecta, electing a Democratic governor. Um, and that's a beautiful vision for Arizona. And I know a vision that we want to see um, across the board uh, and everywhere that we can uh, make that happen. Um, you know, along with, with being and envisioning a Democratic governor in Arizona, I also want and know that a progressive decade can be um, an economy that works for everyone, a Green New Deal, and so much more, not only for us, but for the generations to come. Because y'all, we can have nice things, um, but it's not going to happen on its own, and we all have to work to make it happen. Um, so what does that look like? Uh, where are we now in the current political landscape, um, and where are we going to go? I'm going to pass it over to Billy to tell us a little bit more about where we currently are and then I'll pick it back up to talk a little bit about what we're thinking politically. Billy? Sorry, sorry, unmuting. Thanks, Mirna, and thank you, Alex, for everything. Um, so basically, there are two scenarios. I call them the good scenario and the bad scenario. <laughs> and the bad scenario goes like this. As we know, normally in a midterm year, the president's party typically loses 20 to 30 seats. So we wake up on Wednesday, November 9th, 2022, 2022. We wake up on Wednesday, November 9th, 2022, and we've lost the House. And we lost the Senate by one vote and we've lost the governor of Michigan, the governor of Wisconsin, 
the governor of Pennsylvania, and we've lost the secretary of state in Arizona. And in January, 2023, Republicans control all levers of power, except for the presidency. They control both houses of Congress. They control all the swing state governments. They have us in a vice grip and they change all the voting laws at the state level. And then what happens? Trump says, I'm going to run again. Or maybe it's Ivanka or Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley and they cut into our advantages in the suburbs. And as the 2024 election approaches, we have Biden who will be 81 years old and we have Kamala Harris who would be a historic candidate in many ways, a great candidate, but one who we know will be dealing with unprecedented racism and sexism and xenophobia. And let's be clear, whether we love her or not, if Kamala is our candidate, we need to be prepared to fight with everything we've got to get her elected. And we do. We fight with everything we've got. And the election comes down to a nail biter in the electoral college. But this time, Republicans control the voting process in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Arizona. And we wake up on Wednesday, November 6th, 2024, and the unthinkable has happened again. We're back where we were in 2016, but this time it's even worse. Imagine what they do the second time around. And with climate change, it's game over. So that's the nightmare scenario. I know it's too awful to think about, but we have to think about it because right now we're probably looking at a 50-50 chance of living in that nightmare scenario. And I wanna let that sink in for a moment. I wanna ask you to think about what you'd be willing to do to make sure that we don't end up in that nightmare scenario. We cannot let that happen again. So everyone take a deep breath, shake it off. And let's talk about the good scenario. The good scenario, the good scenario. Still shake off the bad scenario, it's bad. <laughs> okay, we're in the good scenario. We're in the good scenario. The good scenario starts right now, right here on this phone call. We're getting the virus under control. Yay, the numbers are going down. The economy is bouncing back. We pass a $3 trillion infrastructure bill with game-changing investments in renewable energy. And Manchin agrees to a talking filibuster and we pass the For the People Act, which if you haven't read it, what's in it, it's, it's amazing. It's so many good things. Like maybe we even get DC statehood. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? And in all likelihood, we won't get everything we want at the federal level in this year. But we take some giant steps forward so that people see their lives are actually getting better. And so the voting process actually works better. And we go all out and we put everything we have into going big in the 2022 midterms. And we not only hold the House and Senate, we pick up a few seats. And we not only hold the governors and secretaries of state in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and the secretary of state in Arizona, we want to trifecta in Arizona. Yeah, Alex. And we elect Stacey Abrams governor in Georgia. And we go into 2024 in a strong place, no matter who our candidate is, if it's Biden or Kamala Harris or someone else. The basic analysis of making the 2020s a progressive decade, I was thinking about this, is that the first part of the 2020s should be the hardest. If we can survive 2022 and 2024, y'all, over time, the demographics are going to shift in our favor, and there's a decent chance that we can maintain a democratic trifecta at the federal level for the whole decade. If we get through 2022 and 2024, we should be able not only to win a progressive decade, we might be able to win two or three progressive decades. We might be able to have a whole progressive century, okay? We can have universal health care. We can have leadership on climate change to actually save ourselves. 
We can create a more fair and equitable economy. We can greatly reduce poverty. We can greatly reduce mass incarceration and invest in people again. We can reverse a lot of the anti-Black, anti-Asian, anti-immigrant, anti-Latinx, anti-Muslim, anti-women, anti-queer, anti-trans social policies, not only at the federal level, but in the states, in Texas. This is, I wore this for you, Mina. Texas, Texas rising. We're going to transform Texas. We're going to transform Georgia, North Carolina over the next decade. They're going to be the next Nevadas and Colorados and Virginias. And in the decade after that, the 2030s, we're going to do the same to help support groups to transform South Carolina, Mississippi, Tennessee, Indiana, Kansas. There's no question whether there's going to be a progressive decade. There is going to be a progressive decade. The only question is whether it's going to happen in the 2020s or whether we're gonna to have to wait until the 2030s after we spend the 2020s in a trumped up nightmare. And all that is gonna be determined in 2024, which is gonna be largely determined in 2022, which is gonna be determined in large part in 2021, right now. So take a deep breath. Think about both of these scenarios and think about what you are willing to do to make sure we get one scenario and not the other. And I'm going to pass it back to you, Myrna, to talk about the political map. Thanks so much, Billy. I saw a lot of the comments and folks were like, oh, not wanting to think about that horrible scenario. And I'm right there with you, but I'm so inspired by folks um, on this call today that I know um, with your support, we can make sure that we don't live that nightmare ever again. Um, but I uh, want to go ahead and start talking a little bit about what we're thinking for the political landscape here at MVP and how we're doing some of our work um, for these next four years. So this first uh, map that you're seeing right now um, is how we're targeting um, and what we're looking at uh, for the next four years. Um, it talks a little bit and overlays presidential, Senate, uh, House, and so much more. And we're going to dig into each of those um, little by little today. Uh, but the overview of our approach is that uh, we want to make sure that we target every single race that might be competitive. The House, the Senate, state level races starting now to build for 2024 and beyond. Um, our strategy is both to invest uh, broad and deep. We invest in places where their uh, races are most likely to be competitive. And we also invest a modest level in a lot of places to help them build for the long term. And because you never know uh, where there's going to be a surprise like in Alabama in 2017, we just wanna make sure that we're ready. So one of the other things that we do um, that you can't see by looking on this map, but that is so important is that we also look at the organizational landscape, right? We're not just looking at the state and saying like, oh my gosh, this is it. but who are the groups, who are the independent power builders, who are the folks that are going to be there the day after the election to make sure that these people are being held accountable to deliver that progressive decade. So on top of that, we also overlay the ecosystems that we talked about earlier um, to make sure that in the places that we're investing and the places that we're supporting, um, that there are amazing groups that can carry out the work or that are already doing the work um, day in and day out. So. Let's go ahead and dig in first and foremost to the presidential. I know that's on everybody's mind um, and the electoral college. So as we know, uh, if the past four years taught us anything is that presidential uh, races can have a really big impact on pretty much everything. Here at MVP, we're starting out assuming um, that the 2024 presidential map will look similar to the 2020 map. We added Texas. Um, if you don't already know or can't tell, I live in Texas and we have a lot of work to do here. Um, and of course, Georgia and North Carolina. So what used to be our big five at MVP is now our big eight. And we're continuing to also invest in tier two states like Nevada and New Hampshire, just to be safe. And as we can all remember and know, Nevada came a little too close for my liking, for a lot of folks liking, and we have to make sure that we're continuing to invest in places that everyone might think think are for sure, but with growing demographics, the way that um, the other side is investing, we have to make sure that we continue to invest in for the long term. 
Also notice that here we include places like Nebraska 2 and Maine 2, which split their electoral college votes, leaving nothing to chance. Um, and so that's what we're looking at when we think about the presidential map. And I'm passing it over to Billy to talk a little bit more about the Senate. Ah, the Senate. Yeah, the Senate, um, our fundamental analysis is that Democrats have a huge structural disadvantage in the Senate. And it's going to be really hard for Democrats to hold the Senate for at least the dec next decade. So we basically have to treat every single Senate race from now on almost like it's a mini presidential election. So in 2022, can anyone say what the, the three big Senate pickups are? It's Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Those are the three big pickup opportunities. And then there are two big states we know we're going to need to defend, Arizona and Georgia. And there could probably be a couple more uh, tough states to defend, like potentially Nevada. And we're especially worried about New Hampshire. If Governor Sununu, who's a really popular Republican governor of New Hampshire, decides to run against our Senator Maggie Hassan, um, who won her last race by just over a thousand votes. So we're keeping an eye on New Hampshire and also on longer shot pickup opportunities like Iowa, Ohio, Florida, Missouri. But like Mirna said, we want to make sure we leave nothing to chance on either the offense or the defense side. Best case scenario coming out of 2022, we pick up a couple seats in the Senate and then we're not dependent on Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema for everything. And worst case scenario, we lose even one seat and the Senate flips back to Mitch McConnell, which I know none of us ever want to see his face again. So you'll also notice on this map, there are three seats on this map that are up in 2024, Ohio, Montana, and West Virginia. These are the last three red state Democratic Senate seats that are held by Democrats. Just a decade ago, there were 16 red state Democratic senators. Now there are three. So they're basically an endangered species. We have to do everything we can to protect them. We even put Maine on this map for 2026 when Collins' seat is up again. Maine is the only blue state with a Republican senator. That's how serious the situation in the Senate is. We've been planning, we're planning four to six years in advance to make sure we hold on to our precious 50 votes, which is another reason why investing long-term in local power building organizations is a really smart investment. Passing it back to Mirna to talk about the House. Thanks, Billy. Um, the House is almost as tough as the Senate, y'all, and it might be even tougher depending on redistricting because we just had a census this past year among all of the other things that happened in 2020. Democrats uh, currently have a five seat margin and we're likely to lose six to 10 seats in 2022 uh, from reapportionment and redistricting alone. As of now, in the midterm years, usually there's a wave against the president's party, as many of us know. So if 2022 is like any other typical year, we should expect to lose at least 20 seats, um, which I know really sucks. And we're going to have to work really hard to beat those odds. Um, the GOP says already that they're targeting 47 House races, and there are about 50 GOP House seats that are potentially competitive. A lot of the districts are going to be changing and redistricting, so that's something that we're paying close attention to. And MVP is looking to support up to 80 House districts because we have to protect the 47 vulnerable Democratic House districts, and we have to play offense in those GOP um, seats as well. We have to win at least a handful of those two um, if we really want to make this a progressive decade. Um, and it's really important that we take a page from the Republican handbook and go local, invest deep, and make sure that we're paying attention and not forgetting about these more hyper-local races. I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Billy to talk to us about what state power looks like and county races. Thanks, Mirna. We all, um, oh, good. I'm not on mute. Um, <laughs> going back and forth on mute. Okay, we all know how important governors and control state legislatures are. It was super disappointing in 2020 we didn't pick up more state chambers. A lot of people tried really hard. And so now we have to live with the consequences of losing for the next 10 years with redistricting, you know, if we don't pass the For the People Act, right? So also, secretaries of state, super important as our state Supreme Courts, the huge re redistricting wins that we had mid-decade in, in North Carolina and Pennsylvania were driven by Supreme Courts 
that um, allowed us to have fair congressional maps in those states. So we have to pay attention to all of these statewide races. We're gonna do a deeper dive on state legislative maps to figure out what we can do there. It's gonna be a huge project, which is gonna take at least a year due to redistricting. And basically state level races are super important. And MVP is in the process of setting up state packs in a bunch of states so we can engage in these races more. Um, okay, let's go over to counties because counties are not gonna change with redistricting. Anyone heard of Gwinnett County? Maybe Maricopa County? Counties are super important. A lot of times when people talk about having a presence in a state, they're talking about one city like, hey, we're doing work in Pennsylvania. No, you're really just doing work in Philly, right? So MVP deliberately tries to fund groups working in as many counties as possible in a state. We're just in the process of starting our counties project. I'm obsessed with it. We're already tracked, uh, we've already tracked over 300 counties our local partners are actively working in. And counties are really underappreciated. As we saw in the last election, voting issues are often decided at the county level. Criminal justice issues are huge at the county level. DA races, sheriff races, judge races, and also county executives and county budgets. There's a lot that can be done at the county level and even the city level in terms of climate, immigration, economic justice, you name it. And local elections are a great chance to build local organizations. So we're really excited about growing this county and local work. And we have a long way to go. As you can see from this Pennsylvania map, we're currently supporting groups working in 23 of Pennsylvania's 67 counties. There are other major counties like Lackawanna and Luzerne, where Scranton, Hazleton, and Wilkes-Barre are. We don't have partners there yet, so there's a lot of room for growth still. And in the future, we're going to start to strategically overlay counties with these key state ledge and house races. And so to bring it all together, here's the map again with all the overlays. Look, in our dream world, we want to raise enough money to not only invest in battleground states, but in all the red states and blueifying the blue states too. I have a fantasy $300 million budget where we go super deep in all the battlegrounds. And we also have a really robust 50 state strategy too, because we really need to transform the whole country. And now I'm gonna pass it to Myrna to talk about what MVP is doing now in 2021. Thanks, Billy. I know that was a lot y'all. So I do wanna shout out the fact that we have a ton of our awesome team on the chat answering a lot of questions that you all have had. I saw some already, um, just pointing that out because I know that's a lot to take in um, and always feel free to follow up with our advisors if you need any more information. Um, but wanting to dig in a bit to what MVP is doing right now um, to help bring about this progressive decade. Um, our awesome state advisors, many of who are also on the chat and can answer questions, in partnership with our movement partners, are digging in and continuing to learn from 2020. There was so much to learn there, um, and we're continuing to do that analysis and also checking in with them to assess their capacity, their needs. Um, as Alex mentioned earlier, our state advisors are calling and asking what they need now to fight back against voter suppression and so much more. We're also asking groups about their dreams, and these are honestly the best conversations to have, by the way, if you, if you ever um, get a chance to ask somebody what their dreams are for building a progressive decade, the answers will blow your mind. Um, many organizations are sharing with us some really awesome things about how they want to organize more people in more places in their communities. Some of them are working on alliances and coalition building, really awesome collaborations. A lot of them are continuing to strengthen their offline to online, I mean, online to offline organizing and communications capacities. Some states are saying, hey, we realize that we need stronger youth and student strategies. And some states are saying and focusing on rural areas where um, they need more support. Every group and every state is different. There is no one size fits all, um, but they're all doing a really amazing, you know, there's already talk in North Carolina about building a bigger voter registration capacity inspired by the amazing work that happened in Georgia in this past cycle and so much more. We see 2021 here at MVP as a year to do bigger um, strategizing with our partners in each state and also to support, their, to support their capacity and make sure that they continue to become stronger organizations throughout the year. It's important to also note that many of them are just as busy as they were last year. Just because the election is over doesn't mean the work stops, right? Um, this slide has a quick breakdown of what we see as an election cycle. And you can see in the lower half of this um, wheel what a lot of our local partners are doing right now. 
And I'm sure that many of you have already also seen the headlines about the horrible voter suppression bills, anti-trans bills, issues that affect the daily lives of people day in and day out. Um, just last week, we saw shootings that terrorized communities and our movement partners are on the ground responding and ensuring accountability in many of these places. They're also the ones fighting back to make sure that these attempts um, don't continue and things like voter suppression don't go unnoticed. Day in and day out, they're organizing their communities on issues affecting them um, and working to re-engage volunteers from 2020, getting ready for 22, 24 um, and beyond. So what does it look like to support some of these groups to make sure and ensure that they have what they need? It's through several avenues here at MVP, including some funds, some special projects and some capacity building support. So I wanna hit on all three of them a little bit. The first is our, um, our issue and constituency funds. Uh, if you wanna know more about them, you can find them on movement.vote website. Um, but in addition to how we're looking at the states and doing our political overlays and targeting everything else, we think of these funds as a way to make sure that we're giving to these particular constituencies and issues, including the LGBTQ community, native groups, youth groups, Muslim groups, groups that are working on climate um, in any given state or across states. We know that sometimes it's not enough to say we're just going to give to grassroots organizations but that sometimes we really need to make sure that we go deep with some of these different issues and constituencies um, to support their growth and development which are usually and traditionally underinvested and underfunded. The second, and I saw another comment from somebody talking about what our strategies are for red states living in Texas and having grown up in Missouri, I am right there with you. Um, and our amazing uh, former managing director, Regina Clemente, is launching a new project called RAPS, the Western Rural and Plain States Projects that is focusing on red and rural states, including places like Alaska, Montana, and Nebraska. Um, her email is on here and you can reach out for more information. Um, but she's going in deep to make sure that states here are something that are still front and center and that we know that to build um, you know that economy that works for all the progressive decade it doesn't just include blue states it includes all states because people everywhere deserve um, all of the nice things as well and we're working um, in those states too. And finally, I want to talk about our capacity building program, which is one of my favorite things that we do here at MVP. Um, our capacity building program called Match, a Movement Match, inspired by my Match.com love story. It's an actual thing. Um, uh, helps match groups um, with consultants, trainers, or other folks that will help them meet their capacity needs. My amazing colleagues, Eugenio and JPP, have done so um, much work to be able to build out this program and so far have helped over 200 groups get access to tools and support. Um, things like coaching for their um, EDs, for their communications and much more, uh, as well as access to tech tools and discounted digital tools through our partnership with the Movement Cooperative, shout out to TMC. Um, we also give groups customized support depending on what those needs are, um, whether it's building a plan, uh, organizing training series to meet their needs uh, based on popular demand, we do a lot for these groups. I also want to note that we're trying to expand and strengthen uh, the capacity building program and what we can offer our partner organizations uh, in the field. We have big dreams to be able to provide more groups with more support and continue learning with and from them. We get so many messages from groups telling us how much this has helped their work and it's honestly one of the favorite things that we do and the best messages to get. Um, but now what does that look like in practice and on the ground uh, and how do we support these ecosystems? I'm going to pass it over to Billy to introduce some of our amazing partners from Pennsylvania who are going to tell us more about their work and collaboration, which I hope you're as excited as I am to hear about. Billy? Yes, thank you. So one of the things MVP prides itself on is supporting emerging organizations and also organizations that have been around for a long time. but are new to doing electoral work and, and voterizing themselves. Um, so yeah, and also collaborations. What you're about to hear is really incredible um, collaboration story, which we love. And um, without further ado, and I, I just wanna give a shout out to our Pennsylvania State Advisor, Katie Sipp, who um, met with and gave, I think the first grants to all three of these groups to to do electoral work um, and or C4 uh, work. Um, so without further ado, I wanna introduce Salim Holbrook from Free the Ballot slash um, Straight Ahead 
Salim has multiple hats. Um, Brandy Fisher, uh, Brandy Fisher from the Alliance for Police Reform, and Jaziri X from One Hood Power to share about their work. Salim, thank you, thank you. My name is Robert Salim Holbrook. I'm the co-founder of Free to Ballot Incarcerated Family Voter Network. Um, as Billy also said, I wear many hats. I'm also the executive director of the Abolitionist Law Center and it's C4 straight, a, straight ahead. I'm also someone who has served 27 years in prison for an offense I was convicted of as a child. And I was released from prison in 2018 because a strong statewide progressive movement brought me home. I am an example that when we fight, we can win. And even if we don't win, we can build power that can position us to win in the future. Very early on as a co-founder of the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration, a statewide movement composed of family members and their incarcerated loved ones, we realized that we had to contest for power if we wanted to see the change that our communities wanted and deserved. We cut our teeth and had our first taste of power in the 2017 DA election in Philly that brought progressive DA Larry Krasner to office by us mobilizing family members of prisoners from behind the walls of 12 prisons across the state of Pennsylvania. There is no doubt our mobilization of the incarcerated, formerly incarcerated and their family members helped contribute to Krasner's resounding victory and is contributing now to a massive culture change in the office that was once known as America's deadliest DA, now has America's most progressive DA. We emerged from this experience confident and looking for the next fight in 2019, we ran a canvas operation in Delco with MVP funding given to us by Katie, um, supporting progressive district attorney, Jack Stolsteimer. Our canvas op operation resulted and contributed to Delco flipping from red to blue for the first time since the end of the Civil War. We also helped elect Kendra Brooks as an independent candidate to the Philadelphia City Council, removing a Republican city council member who believed that the Republicans were entitled to a seat in Philadelphia, a Democratic stronghold. We realized though that we had to build state power across the state. More, more importantly, we realized that to be successful, there is nothing wrong with us being greedy in pursuit of our electoral victories and building our progressive movement power. Early on, MVP was supportive of us through this growth and continues to support us to this day. Through CADB, we built seven chapters in counties across Pennsylvania and have active membership in three fourths of the state's counties. We are resolved and committed to building a statewide decarceration block that can squeeze and pressure Harrisburg, a block led by impacted community members and movements built by these marginalized communities. We also realize that we cannot have a strong PA without a strong Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. These two cities, these two counties constitute a right and a left hook, specifically toward the Republicans that have had a lock on power in Pennsylvania. Toward that end, we have started building strong alliances and relationships with our partners in Pittsburgh, like One Hood Power. Uh, Jaziri X is someone that I have the privilege of knowing why I was incarcerated. I met Jaziri when I was at SCI Green. Jaziri came up and visited me because I was mentoring youth within the departments of corrections. And he came all the way to Philadelphia to testify at my hearing um, and help bring me home. Um, Alliance for Police Accountability with Brandy Fisher, someone that when I was on the inside at SCI Green, I used to watch Brandy Fisher on the news uh, at SCI Green, watch her out in the streets, leading mobilizations and, process, uh, and protests. And we also have been building with Unite Here with progressive uh, state representative Summer Lee to organize and convene a state of progressive judges in Allegheny County. I'm gonna pass this off to Brandy and Jaziri and let them elaborate more on that. You're muted, Brandy. Thank you. Um, thanks, Salim. Hi, everybody. I'm Brandy Fisher, as Salim stated. Um, I'm the <clears throat> executive director of the Alliance for Police Accountability <clears throat> and also of our, of our PAC. Um, I started this work in 2010. Uh, the organization was birthed out of a local police brutality case here in Pittsburgh. Um, a young man by the name of Jordan Miles, who was 17 years old um, and a performing um, arts student was really beaten by three undercover police officers, almost right in front of his front door. 
<clears throat> and I was at home, um, you know, teaching Sunday school. Uh, I had a childcare that I was running um, for about 17 years. Um, and I saw this come up on the news and I just couldn't believe it. Um, I also was a single mom at the time. And my son was about two years um, apart from the young man um, who was victimized. And so I asked myself as I sat there and watched this, um, what would I do if that was my child? Um, you know, who do you call um, when, when the aggressor is the police? And so I went to a local community meeting. Um, and from there, um, we birthed uh, this organization um, by grassroots organizing um, everyday people um, and, and trying to build power. Um, we were losing, right? You know, when you're looking for justice, we weren't getting police officers charged. They weren't being held accountable. And out of frustration, we were asking ourselves, um, why do we keep losing? I mean, we were able to win civil suits for families, over $6 million we were able to, to you know, win civil suits for families, but that wasn't the justice that we were seeking. Uh, and so, um, when we stepped back to ask ourselves why we were losing, we began to see uh, that this was a whole system and that the DA was involved and that judges were involved. Um, and they had a huge impact on the way that this um, occurred. And so we, were, um, we began to um, move into electoral politics um, because we seen there was no way uh, to win without it. Um, and for the first eight years, that the organization was in existence, um, seven and a half, eight years, I funded the organization out of the money that I made out of my daycare. Um, and so um, we were able to, to build a lot with very little. Um, and it just speaks to the, it speaks volumes to the power of people um, and the work that you can do when people are on the ground. Um, so one of the biggest players in the criminal legal system and one of the people that we always talked about once we realized that this was a, this was bigger than the police was the district attorney. Um, and we were able to get involved in our local DA race um, in, uh, two years ago um, because of MVP. Um, I, you know, it was something I've always wanted to do. We were like, we got to get the DA out of here. Um, that is the problem. And um, some, some folks introduced me to Katie um, and she planted a seed and we got busy and we hit the ground running. Um, we didn't win that race, um, but what we did was we were able um, to, uh, to build power um, you know, for moving forward. We were able to build a movement um, and build capacity and reconnect with our folks. At Pittsburgh, there's been a lot of gentrification, a lot of people being pushed out of their communities. Um, and so this DA race and being on the ground provided us the opportunity to connect with our people. And when I say our people, uh, I mean the people who shared our values when it came to the criminal legal system, right? So we knew that these folks that went to DA in the office, we knew that they supported the work that we did um, in, in the movement. Um, and so uh, from that, uh, just recently, um, you know, last year, the uprising with George Floyd, there were many protests happening um, and we decided to push, um, to push uh, Brianna's law um, with our local city council. And they decided to say no, that they weren't gonna pass this. And so we didn't stop there. What we did was we um, organized and we came up with a way to get this done without them. And we wrote um, two laws. One was Brianna's law um, and the other um, was a law to virtually ban solitary confinement in our local county jail. Uh, we did this with our partners at ACLU and also with our partners at the Abolition Law Center um, to, to get this, this law read, these laws read. Um, and so it seemed like an impossible feat. We're in the middle of a pandemic. It's in the dead of winter. And we needed 12, over 12,000 signatures to get Brianna's law on a ballot and over 27,000 signatures um, to get the solitary confinement bill on a ballot. Um, and we did it. Uh, we were able to get over 66,000 signatures. Um, and I'm still amazed by it. Um, and, the, and it was because of the volunteers. We had over 600 volunteers come um, and work on these campaigns. We had about 100 signing stations. So we had people's porches, right? Because we're in the middle of a pandemic. We had people's porches used as signing stations. And people went to addresses um, and were able to just sign on people's porches without having to have contact with folks. Um, we had a mail operation. And so people mailed 
the, the petitions back in after they signed them. Um, and so that's why we were able to get so many signatures. Uh, we built a coalition of organizations that one with power was a part of, um, and uh, a bunch of other folks um, who were able to, to get signatures from their base as well. And so now we have this, um, you know, the ballots are on, or the, the initiatives are on the ballot in May, um, and we have to get folks out there to vote. Um, the idea was one, it was to snuff the city council, right? It's to let them know that we don't need your permission to make change in our communities and that the people are the ones who decide what they want. And so when we had these signatures, the people spoke and said, yeah, we want these things passed. Um, and then two, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it was also um, to, to show, to, to, to have something on a ballot to move the black voters, right? Um, and, and marginalized communities. You know, a lot of people say that um, underserved communities and marginalized communities don't vote because they don't care. They don't vote because they don't, haven't seen change. They've been voting for years and they haven't seen change in their communities that, that directly impact their quality of life. And so these two things we knew would be something that people knew would cause change and directly <clears throat> impact their quality of life. And so it would push them to the polls. Um, and so this election cycle, we are very excited um, about getting this work done. We're ecstatic about being able to um, not only impact these ballot initiatives, but we have a, a packed ballot this year. Um, we have a mayoral race um, that we are instrumental in. Um, we supported <clears throat> the current mayor um, the last two terms, um, and uh, th that mayor didn't support us, you know, through all the, the protests last year, all the brutality that was happening. Um, and so we decided that we needed somebody new. Uh, and so we have a mayoral race that we're in this year. Um, we have judges on the ballot, um, as Celine mentioned about this coalition. Um, but even outside of the judicial coalition, our organization is also focused on, there's some magistrate district races, right? That's the entry level um, into the criminal legal system. It also, as you've seen in this pandemic, um, is where people, you know, are either evicted or not. You know, those, that's where those decisions are made. So those are very important races to us. Um, there are school board races on the ballot this year, uh, which has a lot to do with our prison, the school to prison pipeline work that we do. Um, and so we can't continue, you know, to, to keep fighting these issues over and over again without starting from the top. You know, and I always say leadership matters. If you have people in the positions of power making the decisions that you need made, then you don't need protests. Then you know, you don't need to be out there fighting as much. And so our goal is to get the right people in the seats. Um, so, so people um, can center their humanity again. Um, we also have a sheriff's race on this ballot, um, our, our county sheriff race. And, um, you know, so we're having an opposition campaign to one of the people who are running, um, <clears throat> who has had a lot of anti-Black policies that he supported, um, you know, mandatory minimums. Um, and so we know we definitely are going backwards if he gets in office. Um, and then these nine seats for the Court of Common Pleas. Um, and one of the things I'm very proud of is that two of the people running for judge are two people that are on our board of, or, of our organization. Um, and so we're really ready uh, to get these people into office um, to, to change the political landscape here. Um, and the last thing is that all of this work really is building, as Billy was talking about, the Senate race for 2022. You know, it's a very big deal here. Um, and as, as we continue to organize and continue to build power, um, and we, we, we look at power as organized money and organized people. Um, and so, you know, that's why we get our coalitions together because we're organizing our money and we're organizing our people and we're definitely going to win. And we thank MVP uh, for their help. And Jasiri? Yeah, uh, peace. And, um, you know, my name is Jasiri X. Um, you know, I, I consider myself a movement artist. Um, you know, some people might know me as a hip hop artist. I'm also um, the co-founder of One Hood Media and the co-founder of One Hood Power. And really, you know, One Hood Power came from the, you know, infectious uh, spirit of Billy Wimsett. You know, um, at, at One Hood, you know, we kind of built this organization, uh, our organization, One Hood. Um, we're a collection of artists and activists. And so we were, you know, uh, um, really, we launched the Artivist Academy in 2018. And our main focus was to support artists that were using their talents and gifts for issues of social justice. Uh, but in you know, one of the things that really shaped the way we began to look differently um, at our city in 2018 was we had a, a, a high profile police killing of a young man named Antoine Rose II. 
He was 17 years old. He was unarmed. He was shot three times in the back while running away for a police officer. So at that point, you know, we were like, we got to get out in the street. So similar to what people saw in 2020 uh, with Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, we got in the streets um, in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County in 2018 um, and really we stayed there from 2018. You know, 2018 Pittsburgh also saw the Tree of Life massacre, the largest massacre of Jewish people in the history of the United States. Um, we began to do that solidarity work with our Jewish brothers and sisters as well, but it caused us to say, you know, and, and then in 2019, that officer who killed Antoine Rose II was found not guilty. So, you know, it's one thing to, to go out in the street and mobilize and protest and it's necessary, but we began to say, okay, well, what else can we do? And how else can we get involved in this? Um, what can we do? Can we change policies and positions so we can stop um, some of these instances before they start? And so I remember, you know, getting a call from Billy about uh, the DA race that happened in Allegheny County in, in 2019 and initially saying like, I'm an artist. I don't really know. I don't. I don't do that type. That, that type of work. You know what I'm saying? And you know, I was. I was really kind of afraid to step into that space. You know, because I, I wasn't sure what I was doing. But you know, as I took a closer look at the DA, you know, in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, black youth 21 times more likely to be tried as as adults in the juvenile system. Every single in 2018, every single juvenile lifer in, in Allegheny County was black. And so it was something where, you know, I felt like I myself and our organization, our platform that we couldn't sit on the sideline. And I know Brandy talked about that. We, we, we lost the DA race, but we actually made history. You know, we, we took a 20 year incumbent. Um, we, with, we had an independent candidate. This was somebody that was not in a, a democratically endorsed candidate to the limit. And we actually won the city of Pittsburgh and the places that we targeted, we doubled um, the voting turnout. And so, you know, unfortunately the county, you know what I'm saying, you know, went with him and he's still there, but we really served notice. And kind of like Brandy said, it was that local organizing that really prepared us for 2020. And, you know, we had, you know, and I don't remember, I don't know if you remember that first conversation we had in January 2020, we was gonna do concerts across the state. We was gonna do everything and we were so excited. And of course COVID happened and this is why we on Zoom right now, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but we still was like, okay, you know, how can we get involved? And so we started to use our social media um, and do a lot of stuff online. So we started a weekly um, uh, Facebook show that we do called the One Hood Power Hour. Where we began to bring on politicians and discuss the issues right to our community. We started a show called What Black Pittsburgh Needs to Know about uh, COVID-19 and about what was going on in our community. We started Ask a Black Doctor about COVID-19. And so we began to just, you know, use our social media as a way of mobilizing folks. And then, you know, we got this golden opportunity in Pennsylvania where we were able to have all of these early voting places. And so, you know, we were able to kind of bring that concert idea to fruition because we actually did three voting festivals in three historically black communities in Pittsburgh on three consecutive weekends. And so we were able to bring food trucks and yeah, we were socially distanced, we had masks on, but we were able to just bring the community out, DJs, you know, people performing, giveaways. And, you know, the, the, the reality about 2020 was it was the black vote that put us in this position, you know what I'm saying? And it was black people in Philadelphia, and I'm sure Maurice will talk about it, Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? You have, you know, Reverend Warnock is leading the charge to, to push down this filibuster. And so, but it was the organizing of, of black people on the ground. This is why to me was powerful about the work that MVP is doing is they're looking at who is these community folks on the ground in these communities. And they're not afraid to support black led organizations because who else is gonna be in our community? Like we have a history with our community. We have a, a respect in our community. And so we're organizing. So we do have this opportunity. We have an opportunity. We have nine court seats open. Um, and somebody put, is it May 18th? It's May 18th, yep, 55 days. This is one quarter of the judges in, um, in Allegheny County. We have an opportunity to remake the very system that oftentimes when we as black people engage government, the first system we engage oftentimes is the criminal justice system. And it's one that oftentimes how we engage it, we, we sometimes aren't able to escape it. And so we can remake these courts and put nine progressive judges on that court. We, uh, Brandy said we have a mayoral race. This is the, this is the race. We have the, the most viable black mayoral candidate in Pittsburgh's history. 
This is what we're talking about. We're to, we have a historic opportunity. We have Brianna's Law and, and, and solidary confinement on the ballot. We have, you know, a slate of, you know, black women that are running for, you know, inspired by Kamala and this movement right now that are running for a school board where we where we work to get police out of our schools and the school boards voted to keep them in. And so we really have an opportunity to show one, like the power of our local vote, but it really helps us to then organize folks for these national elections. If we don't, if we can't get support in the elections that matter most to what happens to our people locally, you know, Brandy mentioned the magistrate. And the last story I'll tell and I'll, I'll go away. A friend of mine a few years ago ran for district magistrate in my where I live. I did not know what district magistrate did. I'm an adult, I'm a whole adult, you know what I'm saying? I, I consider myself conscious and intelligent. I had no idea. Um, and 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 so he he talked to me about this is what a magistrate does about you know who gets evicted in the community, disputes against contractors. And he ran against a guy who ran unopposed for 23 years. This man was allowed to sit in a seat for 23 years and no one even ran against him. You know, his name is Mick Pappas. He's one of the people running for judge right now. He ran and beat the dude in a landslide. And it showed me that like the power of my vote locally is so uh, uh, tremendous and it actually affects what's happening where I live. So I would say, you know, I know we're looking at national races. But if we can support these organizations on the ground and local races, you actually give us power to show our communities the importance of coming together, the importance of, of, of voting, and what we can do in the future. So I will just say thank you, MVP. Thank you, Billy, for the call, MVP, for supporting us. We're we here now. We're here now. We're in the mix. We voting. We, we we doing music around voting and all of that. You know what I'm saying? But, but we can change <laughs> Pittsburgh political structure in 55 days. Help us to do it. Whew. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. Um, we're rooting for you. Anyone who's interested, they still need to raise another, I think, $300,000 to do this right. Um, so we encourage you to support these groups directly or go through the MVP advising process to support them. Um, so next up, we're going to hear Big Pit. Thank you. Thank you, Pittsburgh. Like, woo. Um, next, we're going to hear from Maurice Mitchell for Working Families. And I asked Maurice to ground us in the moment we're in in, in history and how he sees the challenges and opportunities ahead. And, and to share about the extraordinary collaboration that he's been instrumental in, um, in building in this movement. Um, Maurice. Thank you, Billy. And before I get started, I just need to thank Salim, Jaseri, Brandy. Also thank Alex from Lucha in Arizona. The organizing that you're doing is transformative. It's exciting. Uh, it, it motivates me. Um, and if anything, I'm an organizer. Um, I'm, I'm an organizer who worked on the hyper-local level for years and years. And somehow I, I messed around and I'm running an independent political party. And so <laughs> I, I still try to figure out exactly how that chain of events happened, but here we are. Um, and so grateful to be uh, in this space with everybody. There's 410 of us. In the chat, let me just hear you, see you in the chat, say something so that I know that at 8.42 on, on Eastern time, folks are still here and still committed and still interested in digging in. So I wanna see you blow up that chat. Okay, let me, blow it up. All right, I, I know you're here. <laughs> Excellent. So I, I wanna talk a little bit about the stakes. You know, we should absolutely celebrate our victories. But this isn't the time to rest on our laurels, right? So we saw millions of new voters who turned out and they supported these efforts in order to put an end to Trump. However, the election wasn't a repudiation of Trumpism. And we have a lot of work to do as it pertains to challenging and ending Trumpism, right? That the coalition that came together in 2020, and Billy talked a little bit about it, others talked about it. Electorally, it was, it was enough to beat Trump, just enough to beat Trump. But that same coalition as it is, is insufficient for the long-term fights that we have ahead. 
And what we heard about is like the deep, long arc organizing that's necessary in order to make that happen, right? So we really won by razor thin margins in key states, right? Uh, we won, but we narrowly won when you look at the, the margins in, in the swing states in 2020, right? And I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied with it being that much of a clincher when we had historically one of the most divisive neo-fascist presidents in recent history. Uh, some people say he's the worst president, but you know, there's pretty bad presidents in our history. You know, Andrew Jackson was, you know, there's a, we could go through all of them, right? But in recent history, right? And it's true that Biden's victory was, was dependent on massive turnout from, from people of color, especially uh, black folks in places like Philly and Pittsburgh uh, and Atlanta uh, and, and in Detroit, um, and Latinx folks and native folks in Arizona. That's all true. And we should remember that, right? The, but the other thing that I think is, is important to also remember is that Trump's base also turned out and Trump's base is still animated. And there's even some data points to suggest that Trump gained marginally some ground in some communities of color in some states, right? So we need to have a sober reckoning and a sober analysis as we look towards what we need to do. Now, Republicans are making a play to be part of, this is something that I, I wake up and I'm nervous about. Republicans are making a play to be part of the multiracial working class as well as us. Right, so House Majority Leader Kevin McCar McCarthy and 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 Senator Marco Rubio, they both are on the record saying the, that the Republican Party will focus on quote the American worker and rebrand itself as a pro worker party and be the party of the multiracial working class. All of us should be clutching our pearls when we hear that, every single one of us, because what they're committed to and is the long term investments marginally cycle after cycle to make that happen, to basically create a, a multiracial white nationalism. That is their vision. And we know that the right will use ruthless tactics to regain power from political violence like we saw in the Capitol insurrection to voter suppression and Jim Crow tactics like we're seeing throughout the country in, in legislatures all over the place, right? Um, as well as these appeals to reach out to, to people outside of their base. They're gonna use those three tactics and they're gonna invest in those three tactics, right? We will be foolhardy to think that simply because Biden won the election and that Democrats flipped the Senate that the far right, the corporations, the white nationalists, they say, you know, good game, we're going home, right? That is just not the reality. These folks are as dedicated and as motivated for their interests and their ideology as we are to ours. So this is gonna be a protracted battle. Now, we know that working people, poor folks, we know through our lived experience have suffered through a year of COVID, economic collapse, police killings, right? Climate disasters, right? From, from California to uh, the Gulf Coast, right? Now, if working people fail to see real deep material distinctions between life under Trump and life under Biden, they'll look for an alternative to the party in power. Billy talked a little bit about this. So if Democrats fail to deliver meaningful relief and recovery, we risk losing everything our movements fought for. I wanna make a distinction between the Democrats' interest and our movements and our people's interest. There's overlap because the far right and the right wing are dedicated to destroying our democracy, to um, codifying white nationalist rule. The Democrats are interested in, in a different vision, but our movements are the transformative leaders that are pushing the realm of the possible. And so our movements need to defeat the Republicans, ensure that the Democrats are able to, to stay in power, but not simply for the Democrats to stay in power, so, so that our movements could be the main protagonist in this struggle. And that needs to be really clear. If our movements don't continue to lead, then the Democrats, I don't think have, have been able to demonstrate that they have the vision on their own to do that. This is why it's so important that we invest in outside organizations, the deep organizing that transforms conditions. Now, if we do that and we do it well, this could be our new deal moment, right? This could be a moment where people experience material change 
at the scale of the crises that they're, exper that they're experiencing every single day, right? And when we do that, what we'll do is potentially coalesce a new political realignment. Billy talked about the two possibilities. There's either a political realignment to the far, far right over the next decade, or a political realignment that moves us much further towards a, a multiracial democracy and much further towards a social democracy in this country. And the exciting thing about it is that we, the people on this call and others on the ground, have the agency in order to make it happen. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about the solution. So th to me, there's good news, right? So we have a solution that I think worked in November, 2020 and worked in Georgia during the runoffs, right? What it looked like was movements that were dedicated, that were rooted in community, that were building a multiracial coalition, that were able to translate that, that long and deep organi organizing into securing meaningful electoral wins. It meant a movement ecosystem approach. Sometimes donors and others ask like, what's the best group? My answer is yes, right? We, we actually need all of us to be fully resourced, to be in, in relationship to one another, both on the local level, on the national level in order to make it happen. And, and, that, and that nuanced and deep and granular block by block, town by town, county by county organizing. Some of the, some of the organizing that I heard Salim talk about, right, is essential. Now we need to expand our movement, not simply consolidate the people who agree with us. This is really important. This is a, this is a strategic conversation here. There's some folks who are, are, are good at, at consolidating the folks who are already aligned, right? And there's room for that. But our job is to expand our movement. Consolidation only is, is beneficial in an expanding movement. Our movements win by addition and multiplication, right? And, and that's key. We win by addition and multiplication. That is the, the essence of organizing. Now, the other thing I wanna, wanna uh, crystallize is that there's no place called federal, there's no place called national. People live in cities, people live in towns, people live in communities. And we need to make sure that our resources and our strategy is connected deeply to actual people, right? Actual communities, actual community organizations, and that there's an interplay and thoughtful and meaningful and generative relationship between local community building and national infrastructure. So at the same time that we need ambitious national organizing that is grounded in the grassroots, we also need local grassroots organizations. No, so no local organization, for example, can make a national narrative intervention on its own. And no national organization can develop leaders who will be evangelicals for our movement without a robust and deep local organizing ecosystem operating. We need both, right? It's a both and. And we need to let go of what I think is a useless debate around national versus state versus regional versus all in, yes, all of those things, in right relationship, right? It's, it's about being in right relationship. Now, now, from my vantage point, I can't see how we're coordinating at an unprecedented scale and we not win. And I see that happening right now. And it was because we were in the crucible of the fight of our lives to pull our country out of neo-fascism. Sometimes a loss is one of the best conditions in order to create deep collaboration and trust. So we have to struggle with each other deeply over the four years of Trump in order to build this connection. And now we're on the precipice of actually delivering over a decade immigrant justice to the, a, a decade where we could really translate in real ways what defending black life looks like. A demand for a just and real recovery that is a down payment on the Green New Deal, for example, for real jobs and care that are, that are transformative jobs in our local communities and really usher in a multiracial multiracial democracy that is lasting. Now, we are all coordinating and our movement ecosystem is growing and maturing in ways that I didn't think would be possible. And the immigrant rights movement and the movement for black lives and electoral movements and local movements are in conversation, are in struggle. We don't always agree with each other, but we recognize that we need one another in order to make that long arc happen. Now, the role of donors here in all of this, we need to get to all of you. And Movement Voter Project to me is a donor community that showed up early 
that early resources, the early resources is critical because money could be raised and spent and raised and spent, but time is an element, is a resource that once we lose it, we can't regain it. This is why early money is so critical. Like there are things, there are tactics that could be done early that can't be done a few weeks before the election. The deep organizing is the most useful and meaningful resource and strategy, but it only works if it's, if, if it's done early enough. This is why we, we really need to work with Movement Voter Project's community in laying out like a, a broad uh, strategy that focuses on the proximal challenges, like those elections in Pittsburgh, but also the long arc vision of building that multiracial democracy, both and, both the short term and the long term, right? So this is a conversation around both end. And so I'll leave you with this. Uh, and, and I can't stress this anymore. We, none of us can stay on the sidelines and we're all agents. Organizing is about moving folks from being subjects, people who, who spectate to being agents. And we need everybody, practitioners as well as donors to be true agents here. It's, it's irresponsible for us to wait and see, to wait and see to, in order to figure out which fights we need to pick. We need to be here early. We need to meet the scale of the crisis with our passion, with our, with our commitment and with our donations and with our resources. And then we could set the stage in order to ensure that this is a decade that will move us in that direction towards a multiracial democracy. One where the multiracial grassroots are able to secure those victories and be able to propel our country in, in that direction where our movements are the protagonists, not elected officials, right? Not any party, but our movements. Yes, Maurice. Oh, ah, this is so good. Okay, uh, we're almost out of time. So let's talk about money. So we raised over um, 100 million last cycle. We figure we need to raise at least that much again over the next two years, ideally significantly more. Um, we've set a goal to raise at least 30 million this, this year, 2021, but we're targeting a much broader geography. So ideally it should be way more than that, like with the 80 house races Mary was talking about. So. Um, 2021 is the year it's where the smart strategic money is. And speaking of smart and strategic, I'm going to introduce Catherine Orr and Saquon Lawrence, um, who are going to share as donors a little bit about um, their experience uh, with MVP and what y'all are thinking. All right, great. Thanks so much, Billy. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to speak tonight. I'm really humbled to share the space with these amazing speakers. Uh, this was so, I'm just feeling really inspired, and this is exactly why I'm so thrilled to be part of MVP. Um, I'm Catherine Orr. I'm originally from New York City, and I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was proud to be a Pennsylvania voter this cycle, and I'm so impressed and proud of the amazing organizing work going on here in Pittsburgh, and I cannot wait for May 18th. Um, I've been asked to share a little bit about myself and my involvement with MVP, so I finished college in 2004, and I was really furious with that, with the uh, presidential administration at the time. And I want, and I thought that um, I was very idealistic, and I thought democratic politics would be a place I could really make a lot of change. And I worked on several campaigns um, in media and in operations. And part of my job was to get all the stuff for the campaign. And then after the campaign, it was my job to do something with it, to get rid of all this stuff. And it was so wasteful. All these material resources, computers and desks and chairs and phones that we were getting rid of, they really represented all the human resources that were being squandered at the end of the campaign. Because volunteer organizers and team leaders didn't have an organizational home to go to when the campaign ended. And so inevitably the momentum that we built would dissipate. So uh, that was not the right place for me and I drifted away from electoral politics and I realized that my passion lies somewhere else professionally. So I'm actually uh, finishing medical school and I'm gonna become a primary care doctor. But I really missed the political engagement that I'd had in those early years. And I still felt deeply that who were our representatives was crucially important, even though it wasn't where I chose to put my professional efforts. So in the fall of 2018, I was really anxious heading into the midterms and I wanted to support, support voter registration efforts I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this, but I was literally considering Googling voter registration organizations 
in Arizona, Florida, and Texas. It was not strategic. And instead, I remembered that I'd heard something about this organization supporting grassroots electoral work. And I found MVP and I sent them a panicked message. And I got on the phone with Billy and started learning that if I gave through MVP, it would be the opposite. That I would have the backing of real experts on in different states identifying and vetting and supporting organizations so that my dollars going to voter registration efforts would be strategically deployed. And more importantly, that I'd be supporting ongoing work in and by communities that wouldn't disappear after election day like I'd seen on my campaign work. So in 2019, I learned my lesson. I didn't want to be late to the game again. And in January of that year, I decided to reinvest in grassroots groups for the 2020 election. But as I learned more and more about MVP, I realized I wanted to invest in MVP itself in its donor organizing and state advising. So I ended up splitting my gift between groups on the ground and MVP's internal operations. And then MVP grew bigger than any of us imagined and we won in so many places. I really couldn't feel better about this decision. So this year after the Georgia special election and the Capitol attack and the inauguration, I realized I wanted to double down on this work, even though it's a so-called off cycle. Um, and now really is the time for bold investment in this kind of grassroots organizing. So I made a four year stretch commitment to MVP starting now. I already made my 2021 donation and really excitingly, my family has decided to get in on it I had never done any donor organizing before, but when they saw what I did and how good I felt about it and the election outcomes, they are excited to pursue giving in this area. So if you're considering talking to other potential donors, now is the time. The results, especially in Georgia, for people who aren't paying a lot of attention, they saw what happened and they really speak for themselves about the power of grassroots activism. So thank you again, Billy, so much for this invitation to the MVP team, all the donors, and most importantly, the partner organizations. You're so inspiring. And I'm thrilled and honored to be part of this community. Yay, thank you, Catherine. And next we're gonna hear from Saquon and we're gonna go a couple minutes over. All right, thanks, Billy. Uh, this is just really exciting. It's really good to be here. Uh, I can tell you, um, I just want to thank Salim. I want to uh, thank Jaziri and and uh, Brandy and uh, Maurice and uh, Alex and uh, Catherine Orr. Uh, it's really listening to them has been really inspirational. Uh, I can just tell you that MVP for me is part of the spine and the vertebrae for the Democratic Party uh, because for me they've lacked spine. They've lacked a vertebrae. And it's been really disconcerting and frustrating uh, to really watch them get slapped around and pushed around and shoved around. Uh, and I'm starting to feel like the Democratic Party is getting this swagger back. And a big part of that is because of MVP and organizations like MVP. And uh, so I just, I'm gonna thank you all again. Uh, people ask me, why, do I, uh, why did I join MVP? And there are three reasons for this. One is the elegance and the discipline and the power of the five state strategy. That's what got me hooked. Uh, two is the ethical commitment uh, to writing what was wrong. Um, the fact that black led get out the vote organizations were left to fend for themselves in 2016 was an embarrassment. And MVP was a profound corrective. Uh, and then three, the leaders of MVP and how I was introduced to the project. So to that end, I want to thank Jackie Kaplan Perkins and Susan Prisker, who on October 15th, 2019, convinced me to join this historic organization. And I want to also thank Rebecca Williams, who was my thought partner as we organized uh, network events and raised money for Wisconsin and Georgia. And I also want to thank Rima uh, Ahmad in Milwaukee, who made the work real for me through her tales from the front line. So that's, I mean, that's just, that's, that's what got, got me, got me going. Uh, people ask me like, what, what's it like to work with MVP? And just, you know, I can just say it's been inspiring to be part of this organization. Uh, and it's with a sense of history 
and possibilities that I look forward to the progressive decade that MVP will help bring into being. Um, and so I just want to leave by saying, you know, I'm going to, I want to end by saying that, you know, other than making permanent the social safety net and the poverty reduction provisions in the American Rescue Act, there are 10 public policies that I think we have to un undertake to make real the progressive decade. And these are the things that will get my network and my friends and people in the African-American community and progressives excited. I live in Chicago. I don't live in a red state. And so what is it that is going to get folks in Chicago to engage and, and help Maurice and help Celine and help just Siri? What's that message? There are 10 public policies I think we have to undertake. One, and, and we've talked about these this evening, it's HR1, right? Um, HR4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. HR40, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparations Proposals for African Americans Act. HR7120, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. We have to push through and get a new a Green New Deal. And I was talking to Billy about this the other day, and I know this might, this might um, uh, evoke a debate among us, but I think that new Green Deal must include job training, uh, retraining for those in industries that need to go away or occupations that need to go away, like coal mining. I mean, what the hell is that? Coal mining in 2021. Oil companies. But we have a moral ob obligation to make sure that folks are retrained so that they can work in this new green economy. Number six, a ban on assault rifles and common sense background checks and closing these loopholes, All right? Seven, an equity and inclusive infrastructure bill. Eight, statehood for the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, like Hawaii and Alaska before them. Nine, a profound international, uh, profound international leadership on climate change. If we don't deal with this, as Billy says, it's a wrap. And 10, <clears throat> universal health care. And by the way, I think that we can cure cancer this decade. And so that's our North Star. That's what we should be struggling for. That's what we should be organizing for. And that's what we should be donating our money to support. And so I'm going to donate this evening. I'm hoping that everybody in this call donate this evening because we have to continue to support black led grassroots organizations. Um, and like the ones we heard uh, 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 this evening. So in closing, we have to take comfort in the rest that some of us got after this political trench warfare last year and in January, we have to revitalize the movement. Uh, and we have to uh, recommit ourselves. Uh, to greatness. We have to meet the moment. We have to commit, as Marie said, uh, uh, to ourselves, our children, and making the country what it can be. Thank you. This is exciting. Thank you, Saquon. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone who stayed over. We have over 300 people still on after an hour and a half. So I'm going to close this out and just say that was beautiful. And I wanna invite everyone to take a breath together. Think about all you've heard tonight. I wanna to invite you to really dream this dream of a progressive decade with us. And we're gonna to have to work for it. And we're gonna to have to organize everyone we know to be part of making this progressive decade a reality. We're, moving, we're building the movement together. Thank you everyone for everything you're doing. Let's keep supporting each other and building this progressive decade together. And, um, and if you could put the slide back up again of the things you can do, um, this is an invitation to be part of this with us. Um, and I'll pass it to Mirna for a last word. Thanks so much, Billy. I don't know what happened to the video. I'm still here, but thank you all so much for 
spending your evening with us, um, for um, making sure that you're still here way over the time. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, you heard a lot uh, today about what MVP is doing, how we're doing it, and how um, you can support this work and our movement partners on the ground. Uh, but most importantly, you also heard about an amazing vision from Maurice, from Alex, and from all of those people um, that got to talk today and fire us up for what's to come. Um, and that's the vision for this amazing progressive decade uh, where there is enough for all of us. Um, and I know that it's possible and that we can all do it together. Uh, but like we mentioned earlier, we have to work for it, y'all. And as Maurice reminded us, like, it's not going to come easy. We do have to work for it. Um, I have to work for it. You have to work for it. And we're inviting you to join us in that work. We need you, your family, your friends to make sure that the progressive decade becomes a reality for all. So hit us up on the chat or online um, or via email if you need anything to support you um, in this journey as we all collectively work um, to make sure that our children and our children's children live in this progressive decade. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, and I hope you all have a good night. Thank you, Mirna. Thank you, everyone. And anyone who wants to stay, we could do the chant one more time. <laughs> Can you take us all off mic to do it? I say progressive, you say decade. Progressive, decade, progressive, decade. 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 Do this. Yay. We did it. Thank you, everyone. You guys were awesome.